Hello, everyone, and welcome back to How to Chess Season 3. We are pleased to be here with someone I've known through the New York City chess community, even though I don't quite live in New York City. Our guest grew up in the chess hotbed of New York City, uh, got to meet and uh, collaborate with a lot of players, learn. She's from a chess family. She is a mother of three kids. She's an elementary school teacher. Her dad was a chess player. Her husband is a chess player. So steeped in chess, she is also a chessable author, hard at work on finalizing a course, as we will discuss. And she is a national master and competed in the U.S. Women's Championship. So obviously, strong player as well, in addition to a teacher. And we are excited to welcome Laura Smith to the show. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, excited to have you as well. Um, And Laura, as I've told you, as I tipped you off, the theme of this season is role models. We're discussing who we can learn from, whether they be some prominent chess player, someone local in our community, or possibly in your case, uh, someone from your family. But obviously, um, there's a lot to choose from with someone who grew up steeped in chess culture like yourself. But what came to mind when I mentioned that the theme of this show was chess role models? Yes. So I went first to my go-to, my Judith Polgar, mine. Like I haven't, <laughs> I met her one <laughs> no, she's time. Mine. She's mine. Um, yeah. She's mine. So, you know, and I don't mind because if that's how I feel, that's how I feel. Um, as a young girl, no, she was top 10 in the world um, when I was growing up, top 10 in the world. Um, and that made me feel like I can defeat anyone, especially when I was growing up, we might chat about it more in our, in this podcast, but you know, there didn't feel to be that many females. And I know that's still a challenge, but things are changing. And back when in the nineties, when I was playing chess, there were very few girls and women. So just seeing her even in the news um, and getting to play her in a Simul in Queens will be in my um, my long-term memory. <laughs> wow. Well, let's hear the story about the Simul. How old were you when you got that opportunity? I was around nine or 10. I've asked my dear mom, shout out to my parents. As you mentioned, I'm very lucky to have had a lot of support um, growing up and my dad plays chess, but my mom schlepped me everywhere too. So shout out to you, mom. She brought me um, and I asked her, mom, can you find the picture with me playing Judith Polgar? You know, that classic handshaking moment. She's still searching. So I will, I, I'll say approximately nine or 10 years old, maybe 11, not older than that in Queens, Rego Park. Excellent. Yeah. And you grew up in Queens, of course, started chess at six. So I'm guessing you were already a pretty good player by then, Laura, being that you were kind of a scholastic champion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Like I was getting, um, definitely had really cool experiences going to the world youth a couple of times by the the time I uh, played in that simul. So that was great. She won. I didn't have any chances in that game, but um, it was amazing (laughs) and fun and starstruck, you know. uh, Of of course. in the presence of the top female in the world and top 10 of all people. So. Yeah, just such a legend. And let me ask you, Laura. So obviously, as you mentioned, uh, there's not as much female representation as we would like in the chess world. I agree with you that hopefully it's moving in the right direction, but it's still not where we want it to be. So when you were a young girl and you were looking at someone like you did, um, was it, did you actually emulate her chess? Of course, she's renowned as a fierce attacking player. Or was it more just the fact that there's representation that you know that there's some, there's a, a girl out there doing it, crushing people, and that, that that alone is enough of an example? Amazing question. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say that back in the day, they didn't have chessable. So I couldn't like just go online and buy all her books. I mean, I had the classic, um, thousand, I don't know, the thousand and one puzzles by her, her dad, but that's not the, the same, brick. but I yeah. did have that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, But um, did I know all her games and repertoires? Absolutely not. But I did know a few classic games and I, you know, my family would always remind me like I can I can be whatever I want to be. And like, look at Judith, like she she beat Kasparov. Like, (laughs) so I knew a lot of the stories and I did like her aggressive play for sure, because I, I always was an attacking player from the beginning. Okay, yeah, so it's a natural fit. But Laura, like we said, you grew up in New York, lucky to have the Marshall Chess Club still going strong. I know you played at the Manhattan Chess Club, which unfortunately is no longer with us. May it rest in peace. Um, But 
that means that there were a lot of other chess role models around. You're competing in national events so that there's other even stronger girls, or now women, but girls then than you. So are there other people that come to mind as role models even beyond uh, the legend Yuta Polgar? Definitely. So some that were in my generation, of course, Arena Crush. It was awesome to see her, saw her confidence at the chess club and in, a, in international events. And also Tatev, um, Abrahamian, like she was in a little closer to age to me and she's a serious chess player. I consider myself, I'm very proud of where I got, but she definitely is like a professional, you know? So that was amazing. And nowadays I was, I've been reaching out to her like, hi, how are you? Like, you know, and she's been so welcoming and like I started streaming and I asked her questions, stuff like that has been really great. So even back then I could see um, role models, like people my own age, but maybe, you know, putting in all those hours, it was great. And now today, um, as a grown up, um, we still, are, I still feel like I have that chess family. Yeah. And shout out to Tatia of, uh, um, doing great work. Now she's writing a column for Chess Life magazine, in addition to her other work, chess teaching and working with a chess startup as well. Um, so what about in terms of chess? So you mentioned you shared an attacking style with Udit. Um, was there anywhere, and of course your dad was a chess player and I'm sure taught you along the way and you had coaches as well. Um, what, do you recall any chess lessons that were imparted to you that really you felt like um, pushed you to another level? I feel like I really love the Greek gift sacrifice um, and now teaching it to my kids, um, my ki- my students. It's great because um, they find it fascinating too, just like giving up that bishop and like knight g5, queen h5. Um, that was the first thing that came to mind when you asked that question. And let um, me ask you, yeah. I've got to follow up on that one because... I, of course, it's iconic sacrifice. There's so many cool games. I remember reading it, uh, reading The Art of Attack, which, of course, is available on Chessable these days uh, by, um, I'm going to butcher his name, but uh, Vukovic. Um, and, uh, but I don't recall thinking of it as the Greek gift until later. Now I feel like it's sort of entered the chess lexicon as the Greek gift. I'm curious, Laura, when you learned it as a kid, did you say, did you, did you recall learning like this is the Greek gift sacrifice or you just remember the Ooh, actual sacrifice? I like that. That's a tough one. Because it's like, you know, they say you hear things when you're a key, like, you might look at a photo album. This is what I, this is what I've heard. I know it's a little tangent, but that's my brain. Um, when you look at a photo album before you were age three, you might, your family might be like, look at you here, but you don't really remember it. So maybe now that I coach, I coach kids, look, this is the Greek gift sacrifice. I don't, I honestly don't know. That's a good yeah, question. Um, I, I wonder just remember well. learning sacrifices to open up the king, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I wonder as well, because having taught my share of uh, kids as well, um, one thing I've noticed is when something has a cool name, it's it's much more likely to to resonate. And obviously, there's the Greek gift, which you can tell the story of the Trojan horse, uh, if inspired. So you learned about the Greek gift. Um, what about lessons, again, either from playing Tatyev? I know you played Tatyev in a few uh, nationals. Um, she's a tough, tough opponent, of course. Yes. Um, or from your coaches. <laughs> Any other lessons that spring to mind, Laura? Like um, things I've learned from other players? Yeah. Yeah. So growing up, I was um, lucky to study with some awesome chess players. Like I remember Lev Millman. He was really good at the Moritz Smith Moore Gambit. So watching him destroy people, I was like, oh, I can I can try that, too. So like learning from osmosis, you know, learning from the people who are better than you. That's why I try to encourage my students to play with people kids who may be a little older, who've been playing for a little while, to be okay with losing because the best way to get better is to play harder players. So Yeah, that's a great attitude. And do you find that your students, for the most part, do they embrace that or does it take convincing? It definitely takes convincing, but I noticed that some do crave competition. They don't want to just be in a beginner class forever. So a lot of my students go on chess kid and they play each other and then they know who's like the big fish in the pond. Right. And, and that encourages them to pay attention. Like, I don't want to get four move checkmated. I better focus on that just as an example. And then next time I'm not going to let them do that. I'm going to block, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to block that attack. Yeah. And of course my friend Greg Shahadi has, has said that, if 
if you see a kid who gets really upset when they lose, I mean, it's not fun. You know, you don't want them to be upset, but it often can be that sort of uh, indicator that maybe they're going to advance. Because as you say, if you get four yes. moves checkmated, you know, for me, it happened like 10 times before. Finally, I was like, all right, enough is enough. I'm going to learn this. <laughs> And this was not the internet age, as you as you alluded to. This was back in the Stone Ages, where you had to figure out how to stop it for yourself if you didn't have the network uh, exactly. to help you there. I didn't have the role models yet. Yeah, like some tears. I mean, I always, you're going to comfort your student, and then you're like, wow, this kid's coming. Like, if they're like, then when they come back, they're stronger. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, sad at the time, but often can lead to greater success down the road. Now, Laura, as we record this, you just mentioned before we were recording, you're finishing up a chessable course that will likely be available um, by the time that this podcast comes out. So let's hear about the course. Oh, yeah, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity. Um, throughout um, the pandemic, I was really lucky to get an opportunity with the amazing Jennifer Shahadi. She reached out to me and asked me to teach, uh, help her teach the beginner women's club and on Zoom. And it was the first time, <clears throat> excuse me, that I started working with adults and I loved it. And so I started to see how teaching adults is maybe different than teaching just teaching just kids. That's also during the time that I um picked up some books from my husband had had the step method hanging, hanging around the house. And I was like, this is amazing. I want to teach from the basics. So I started developing a style. I also got a shout out to national master. Dan Heisman has really um, also has really collaborated with me. He's shared so many resources with me and just like the way to teach both kids and adults about board vision and making sure they're looking at the forcing moves. So I was like, I want to create a course for people who know the basics but want to get better at calculation in the range of under 1400 with some challenging material <clears throat> but based for people 900 a thousand I feel like even though that's a range I feel like the thought process can be applied in that area a lot so yeah I'm really excited <clears throat> I've pulled from some of my students games my own games when I was a young kid Dig, dug some cool games out that I won. Some blunders of mine will be a chapter. Hmm. See if you can find Laura's blunders. And yeah, I'm just really excited um, to hopefully, yeah, to hopefully go through with this all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. I know that feeling. Until it's out in the world, you can't be sure. But a couple of things to add. Number one, of course, I'm a big Dan Heisman fan as well. Uh, amazing teacher and definitely recommend his YouTube channel. He's a great communicator and uh, good for uh, whether you have kids or whether um, you're, especially as you say, if you're rated below 1400 or something like that, uh, yeah. Dan, Dan is a great communicator. Um, and Laura, I think a lot of people uh, watching or listening will know what forcing moves are. And a couple things to mention. Number one, there's a course by Charles Hurtan. It's also a book yeah. called Forcing Chess Moves. Um, that's a great book, but you probably shouldn't get it instead of Laura's because they're totally different audiences. That's a book that I would say is primarily for like 1800 and above. Um, but for people who are thinking about getting your book, we should probably first and foremost make sure everyone knows what a forcing chess move is. Yeah, no, thank you for that, for the shout out. I mean, that is an amazing book. I own it, Forcing Moves by Hurtan. And like, yeah, and I feel like I, my goal is for all students to get to 1800 or even 15, 16, 7, whatever you want to call it, that would also benefit from that amazing book. So a forcing move, in my definition, um, there's checks, the most forcing move, captures, and then threats. And I define each. We look at some examples. Some checks are better than others, especially when I teach now my in-person kids. I notice, you know, they often settle for one check when there's a checkmate on the board. So looking at your checks, which one's best? And captures, like looking at all the captures and which ones are better and calculating. I would say my most, the majority of my material in this course, it's like two ply or le like two ply. If I go there and they go there, I go there. Um, and so, and threats, like, can you make a threat they can't stop? Are you even looking at your threats? So like going from there and then some of the material might be a little more fancy, but it's fun to see because most of the games I pulled, um, I was so excited on Twitter shout out to the chess punks a lot of them i've gotten um close with in collaborations and it's amazing them sharing their adult journey becoming better at chess and they've shared some i asked if you have any examples of using a forcing move and winning material it doesn't have to be a fancy checkmate like i did this check and it led to 
a win, send it to me. So a lot of these games are from people in the 900 to 1200 range. And I feel like a good, a good model helps. Like these are not, these are not computer generated puzzles. These are like real life. Like this happens in the chess.com game or a Lee chess match. So yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I saw when you posted that question, I'm glad you got some helpful replies. <laughs> Shout out to the chess punks from me as well. And I'll tell you one other follow-up on forcing chess moves. Uh, speaking of uh, role models, I actually stole um, a teaching tidbit, although I incorporated it into my play as well from uh, Elizabeth Pates, who recently became a grandmaster. Congratulations Yay! to her. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, she had a video where she walked through some tactics. I believe it was from a, a Romaine Edward calculation book. So obviously this is high level stuff, but she differentiated forcing moves in a way that I had not heard before, which was, Ooh. she said, look at checking captures first, uh, meaning ones that Ooh, combine I'm gonna the I'm going to write two. some notes because the course is <laughs> yeah. not done yet. Okay. Yeah. So you've got <laughs> checks, captures, and threats, but if you have a move that yeah. does both at once, start with that one because it's Ooh, like a daily what? double. And then on the sort of stuff that I haven't stolen spectrum, there's the legendary grandmaster trainer, R.B. Ramesh, who, of course, has worked with Pragananda and so many other top players. So obviously he's just like on another level, but he includes pawn breaks into yeah. forcing moves. And, you know, he knows way more about chess training than I do. But that one I leave out for the purpose of uh, higher, you know, teaching newer players, because I feel like you really want to focus on the brass tacks, on the um, the most elemental tactics rather than more advanced stuff like trying to open up a, a line. Exactly. Yeah. That's my philosophy. And, you know, I mean, that could be another, another long tangent, but I just feel like ever since I discovered the step method, big shout out to that. I mean, that really inspired me as well because like in the, the uh, in the Netherlands, they use that and look, they've got some amazing players. And um, I like the philosophy of not rushing. Why are we rushing our chess instruction? Like if kids, I guess I'm using kids as an example because I teach in person kids and online I teach adults. But like in person, like if I'm if t if my student isn't seeing a bishop's attacking a rook, why am I teaching them a, a pin even? I love pins. They're fun. But like for me, I just don't understand how we can get to that concept if they're not noticing the basic captures on the board like that bishop can capture that rook. Yeah, well said. And and for people, and I think part of it also, especially with adults, it might come from, you know, you know that there's a vast chess world out there and you know that there are these deep ideas to be discovered. So there's a temptation to go beyond what's actually um, impacting your games the most. So um, there there's an element where like, uh, yes, sometimes presenters don't do the best job suggesting things. They might suggest stuff that's too advanced. But I think there's also students who they might hear a, a recommendation and you say a recommendation is for a certain level and they want to get it anyway, you know? And, you know... I know. Uh, and, and I understand that as well. I do the same thing. Yeah. Um, but but nonetheless, uh, there, as you're alluding to, Laura, the, what I'm trying to say is the most important thing is really just to get really good at the basics. And then from there, your game can grow even more. And it sounds like your course is going to be a great addition to that. And of course, I agree with you about the chess steps method as well. Um, so Laura, as we wrap up, one thing I want to add is we've, we've named a lot of useful resources here. So for any listeners scrambling, we'll put links to all of them, including, of course, Laura's course and Laura's information into the show description. And Laura, if people do want to keep up with you, possibly reach out for lessons, definitely to check out your chess course. Uh, what is the best way for them to do that? Oh, thank you so much. I um, really appreciate all that. So you can, um, um, on Twitter, you know, I'm, I try to be as um, active as possible. I'm on um, Laura Loves Chess. And my email, same thing, lauralovechess at gmail.com. Okay, excellent. So we will link to that. You try to be as active as possible for a working mother of three who's trying to finish a chess book course. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've all got a, a lot going on. So on that note, I appreciate all the more, Laura, that you were able to join us here on the How to Chess pod. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Ben.